I'm here today with David Gore. David is a professor in the Department of Communication at University of Minnesota Duluth, and he teaches rhetoric. Um, he's also the author of The Voice of the People, Political Rhetoric in the Book of Mormon, that was published by the Maxwell Institute. Um, and today we're looking at Minerva Teichert's um, Christian Converts. This is from about 1950. Um, it's in the BYU Museum of Art today. And it deals with some scriptures um, from Alma 23 to 29. So David, can you just kind of contextualize what's happening here? What scripture passages are being portrayed? Yeah, so this is representing a story from Alma chapter 24. And uh, the story is essentially a group of Christian converts who, as part of their conversion to Christianity, realize that uh, they no longer want to use weapons in war. And so as part of that process, they decide that, uh, that their participation in war was a violation of promises that they wanted to make to God. And so they bury their weapons in the ground. And then uh, when they go forth to meet their enemies, uh, they go in peace without weapons. And they kneel down, basically uh, relying upon the mercy of their enemies to save them and on the mercy of God to save them. Uh, and the what happens in that story of course is their enemies come upon them march upon them in battle and slaughter over a thousand of them before their enemies themselves have a change of heart and decide that uh this this practice of slaughtering people who are unarmed is is clearly not not right and they have a change of heart and repent themselves and join these people in this covenant of peace mm -hmm. And so that's the that's the story that's being represented here in this painting. Mm -hmm. And uh, as you can see, uh, there are two panels in the painting. And the first panel, the, the upper panel mm -hmm. of the painting, depicts uh, 14 figures. And they're arrayed in a line. And uh, five of those figures are, on the, if you start on the left-hand side, there are mm -hmm. five figures standing. Okay. And there are four figures kneeling. Mm -hmm with one of those figures uh, kneeling in a prostrate fashion, mm -hmm. yeah. completely uh, down on the ground with their face to the ground. On the right-hand side of that first panel are five figures who appear to be advancing towards those other nine figures in the painting. And those five figures uh, have weapons raised and are clearly coming in battle uh, to the others. The other nine figures there on the left are unarmed. Mm -hmm. and clearly represent the Antonifi Lehi's who are laying down their lives in this battle. So that's the first panel of what's happening there. And uh, then in the second panel, uh, we have 13 figures. So that's interesting, first of all, because there's one fewer figures mm -hmm. in the lower panel, which might suggest uh, that one of those figures in the upper panel has died. The 13 figures in the lower panel, there are no weapons present. Uh, instead, they have implements or tools for digging. There's a pickaxe and there's a shovel and some rakes, but they appear to be standing in front of a piece of ground that they have dug up, and it appears that they buried their weapons in the ground. But that, that, that burial could also, of course, represent a grave for the figure in the upper panel, potentially, right? Or metaphorically, it certainly evokes a grave, that these weapons being buried in the ground, that practice of burial is something that we do for our dead. And that's one of the things that makes us distinctively human, is that we bury uh, our dead, and in this case, they're burying their weapons so that they no longer participate in cycles of violence that produce dead bodies. So, so there's a lot of symbolism going on there in the painting that I think is, is worth thinking about and is represented by uh, these two panels. I think chronologically, the anti-Nephi Lehi's in the first panel have already buried their weapons. Okay. So the way that I read the second panel is that these are the, the, the enemies who had come, had marched upon them, and they have had their change of heart and are now bearing their own weapons in response to their, their conversion and their change of heart. And one of the ways to read that, I think, is that uh, there are the 13 figures in the lower panel there are two figures who are standing uh, on each end that are not facing the, the audience, the viewers of the painting, but are facing the 11 figures standing there. And it almost appears as if they're teaching them how to bury their weapons, teaching them how to, to, to live a different kind of life here. Uh, and it's, it's almost as if they're overseeing that work or teaching them 
how to, to bury their weapons and to let go of that that uh, that past yeah, of that's, violence. That's beautiful. I noticed the two figures look a little different, and their costuming is different. And I wonder if this this figure here looks more like the anti Nephi Lehi's here. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and then he looks different from these, which makes me think you're right that these are the enemies that have come that have then been converted. And then this figure, I'm wondering if maybe this is Ammon, um, who had converted all of them, who had you know been a missionary, um, gotten this whole process started because he's. His costuming is a little more ancient Near Eastern. With yeah, the, you're right. The headdress and the robe and yeah. the sandals. It's not easy to tell from the costuming whether any mm -hmm. of the figures in the lower panel are the same as the figures in the upper panel. But, yeah. But it certainly appears that they are uh, of the same time period and uh, yeah, part of the same story, obviously. Yeah, yeah. Um, is there anything that strikes you as especially unique about this piece? or? Yeah, absolutely. So. Um, in, in classical rhetoric, in ancient rhetoric, often uh, the use of our tongue is represented as a sword. So that we, sometimes it's, uh, the word ornament in classical rhetoric also refers to armament, like a weapon. Okay. So when we ornament a discourse with uh, stylistic devices, we can, we, we can think about it as a substitute for violence, mm -hmm. using words instead of violence in our arguments trying to persuade people instead of compelling people with violence. Mm -hmm. And so often we think about rhetoric as an alternative to violence, and yet uh, rhetoric also has adopted some of the tools, uh, at least symbolically or metaphorically, of real violence in order to describe its art. I think that's one of the things that's happening here in this painting, is that we can think about uh, these weapons in a symbolic kind of way. Mm -hmm. Elder Patrick Kieran gave a great talk about this particular uh, story in general conference a few years ago and talked about the importance of bearing our own weapons of rebellion in the mm -hmm. ground letting go of the things in our heart that are holding us back from being devoted to the gospel and i think uh both in in rhetoric and in elder kieran's talk we think about these weapons symbolically and that's really important for us to do that mm -hmm. at the same time though uh this story is also about real weapons real weapons that killed real people and so I think the painting is also uh, suggesting to us that we consider our own relationship to real weapons. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that each of us has to sort of think about and wrestle with. This story clearly uh, shows us, I think, the, the, the kind of story that's evoked uh, by Isaiah when he tells us to beat our swords into plowshares. Yeah. And this lower image of the lower panel of the painting suggests, mm -hmm. again, that, that this broken earth idea of, of breaking up the earth in order to plant a new kind of life. And I think that's really powerful in a way of rethinking what, what we're using our weapons for, what we're using our, the, our implements for. Because weapons are a tool, but there are other kinds of tools we can also use. And, and the story of the scriptures is that we should be focusing more on the tools of peace and the tools of cultivating uh, deeper relationships with God, deeper relationships with the earth, uh, deeper relationships with each other that would foster, you know, I think, greater compassion and greater dignity in, in human beings. Yeah. And I think that's uh, an interesting problem that's presented by actual weapons, real weapons right. in the real world. And so we have, to, we have to also not just make this story about symbolic weapons, but also <laughs> about real ones. That's fascinating. And I love the beautiful comparison to Isaiah and, and the plowshares. And I definitely see that happening here, going from the weapons of war to these more agricultural tools. Exactly. That's really interesting. Yeah, that transformation is happening there at work in a painting as well. Yeah. yeah. You know, as I was looking at it, it reminded me, because I'm an art historian, it reminded me a lot of an ancient Sumerian piece, the Standard of Ur, um, which is from the 3rd century BC, and it has similar kind of red figures on a blue background. Uh, and one, it's a little box, and one side of the box depicts um, scenes of war, and the other side depicts scenes of peace. And, and then it has these registers, and it just, I, I wondered if um, Minerva Tyker, with all of her art training, was, was drawing on these ideas with these kind of registers and figures lined up in the front of the picture plane um, to capture a similar sort of theme of war and peace. Yeah, that's a fascinating mm -hmm. thought. I, I think um, to think about the, the connection of, or the transformation of violence, when we, when we look at images of violence, uh, particularly in the upper panel and the lower panel, you can almost see this transformation, the, the choice almost yeah. between violence and peace. And how we depict that can often determine how we can live that. Yeah. Right? Yeah. 
Do you have any like personal reaction to the piece? Or? Well, I had never seen the piece before, yeah. uh, just a couple weeks ago, and I was really glad you asked me to think about it and to, to think with it. And I mm -hmm. think uh, I love the way that it brings to life the scriptures, and I think that's the really the, really the power of, of art in many cases is to represent to us, represent again the stories. Yeah in the scriptures in a way that causes us or invites us to think about it in a new way yeah, absolutely. maybe in a deeper way and that's one of the beauties of of this piece and also the project that you're working on so oh, i really appreciate it yeah no i appreciate that i i definitely felt like that too as i've looked at this piece this week and um i just i felt like it really captured um something very emotionally powerful of these anti-nephi lehi's that are just offering themselves up for slaughter um, yeah. because they've made this covenant of peace with god um, and even just lining up, waiting their turn to be executed. Um, I think it's really powerful. It, indeed it is. Mm -hmm. And in, in that sense, in the story too, they're not just waiting to be executed, but they're literally laying their lives down for yeah. those who are executing them because mm -hmm. they have a change of heart because of that gesture. Oh, yeah. So in a way, it's also a vicarious act in, in the true spirit of Christianity. Oh, that's beautiful. Right? Yeah. Well, thank so, you so much, David. I absolutely. appreciate you staying down with me today. My pleasure. Thank okay. you.